Ted Lasso was a surprise hit in 2020. Its ensemble cast and warm-hearted brand of humor proved a welcome addition to the streaming landscape, especially for those of us who wanted a distraction from the ongoing global pandemic, along with those of us who purchased Apple products and just wanted to figure out what we could watch with a one-year free trial of Apple TV+. By the time season one concluded, many of us were invested in the show's lineup of great characters. Viewers found someone in this show that they loved or related to most, or both. And for many, Nathan Shelley, or Nate, or Nate the Great, became a fan favorite. I love this kid. His bumbling, awkward demeanor provided an excellent contrast among these many self-assured characters taking the field at Nelson Road Stadium or walking the front halls. In season two of the series, however, Nate's character heads down a path that many viewers, including myself, did not expect. And before I go any further, I'd like to warn you that this video includes spoilers for season one and season two of Ted Lasso. If you haven't watched both seasons of Ted Lasso, please like, subscribe, hit the bell for notifications, then promptly go watch Ted Lasso. When season two came around, the bashful equipment manager we saw in season one was now self-absorbed, spiteful, and gray. The shift in Nate's character felt jarring to many viewers, to the extent that Nick Muhammad took to social media and a number of online publications to point out that his character's turn was by design from the beginning. In fact, if you look back at everything that led to this moment, you'll realize that there were moments, both subtle and obvious, that Nathan Shelley's evolution from the timid kit man to a full-blown West Ham United villain was happening right before our eyes across the 22 episodes that exist to date, and I'd like to revisit those moments. Now, season two is where we witness the bulk of Nate's character evolution toward his final form, but there are a handful of moments in season one that really suggest Nate's character arc was being primed for a tragic fall to the dark side. So, with that said... Let's dive into Nate the Great's fall from grace from the very beginning. The very beginning, as in Nate's very first scene in the entire series. The moment we meet Nate, he's shouting at Ted and Coach Beard for being on the field. He isn't aware of who he's shouting at initially. He's yelling at strangers without assessing the situation. God, you're the new manager. Yes, sir. I didn't look to take all the grass you want. Oh, no, we just that, had it that's cut. very I can nice. go through the garbage if you want. I can get you some more. Uh, that's all right. No. It's really just an innocent misunderstanding. But it's also our first impression of Nate, who, as we will eventually see, will show more misguided aggression and have his judgment clouded by misunderstandings like this. From here on out, we get a better picture of Nate's world. He's not respected by the players. He's practically invisible to the front office. And it isn't until Ted comes around that Nate is given any level of attention and respect from what we can tell. Ted injects confidence into Nate, which at times only escalates his outward aggression and sense of entitlement. The scene in which Nate roasts players in the locker room, it's one of the more memorable moments of season one. You think that's funny, do you, Colin? You know your fancy step over bullshit. Let me ask you this, do you wax your pubes? <laughs> what? Did I stutter, dickhead? Do you wax your pubes, yes or no? No. Then why are you always trying to play like a Brazilian? <laughs> yeah. The moment is still very funny, in my opinion, but after you've experienced the path that Nate goes down in season two, it's not a stretch to say that Nate's spite in this scene feels a bit heavier on a second watch. Interestingly enough, right before Nate's roast, Ted apologizes to Nate for his outburst the previous night. This is an important moment because it's the last time Ted and Nate have a one-on-one -on -one conversation until the season two finale, but more on that in a bit. Nate's inability to handle his insecurities was always present in season one. When Will was hired as the new clubhouse attendant, Nate immediately sees him as a threat and even lashes out at Rebecca. You shrew, you did this, didn't you? Why so hostile, Nathan? Nate's back is against the wall in this moment and he loses what little control he had over his anger for a brief moment. It's a funny scene, especially once the payoff is realized Nate is actually being recognized, promoted, and therefore given greater status, which he really, really wants. You may not have realized it in this moment, but that's a problem, at least for Nate. Look, Nate has been the butt of jokes up to this point. He's been bullied, and he didn't have a voice until Ted came into the picture. So we celebrated his rise in status in season one, as we should. However, Nate's inability to handle his success is an issue. Nate looks at people in power and wants to be them. Presently, he looks at himself 
as an example of someone to push aside in order to become powerful. It's why he treats Will the way that he does. Will not only moved in on his job, but in doing so, Will embodies everything Nate despised about himself as a lowly clubhouse attendant. Nate watches those around him to understand what it means to be powerful. As actor Nick Muhammad describes in a recent interview with Vulture, rather than dance with everyone at the charity dinner in episode four, he stays seated and takes in the environment, which consists of Ted, Rebecca, and Rupert, all in the same room, and all people he sees as either powerful people or people in a position of power. When season two kicks off, we find that Nate is still coaching. He still torments Will, and he's still... It's a tad aggressive. And despite the fact that he's getting support from those around him, including Keely and Rebecca, who help Nate become more assertive in order to get the window seat for his dinner reservations, Nate remains fixated on what he lacks. This fixation becomes worse as Ted welcomes Jamie Tart back to the team, along with, more significantly, bringing Roy Kent on as a coach. Ted doesn't realize it at the time, but it's decisions such as these that Nate takes personally, and, right or wrong, they add to the growing list of transgressions that Nate is taking note of throughout Season 2. It's a paradox, of course. The more confidence Nate gains and the more attention Nate gets, the more his fragile ego inflates. Two episodes later, Nate steps up in a time of crisis. He spits at the ground and makes a decision on the field, which results in an AFC Richmond win. About the spitting, by the way. Nate's spitting is interesting, not just because of the obvious. Look, it's Nate's way of being the aggressor as he sort of battles himself. Remember, he perceives people of power as aggressive, while soft-spoken, timid people are to be pushed aside. But it's even more interesting because Rebecca gave Nate the advice of making himself feel bigger whenever he needs the confidence. Rebecca explains her approach to this. She finds a place to be alone where she extends her arms and growls. She's physically making herself appear bigger for the boost of confidence. Nate takes this advice, and rather than make himself appear bigger in the physical sense, he wants to ensure that he's shrinking the part of himself that he despises, the awkward and timid Nate. And so he spits on him. This act of spite or humiliation towards someone or something else is what fulfills his sense of power. Back to the AFC Richmond win, though. Nate makes headlines. He's all over social media. He's the wonder kid instead of the wonderkin. Regardless, his ego is at an all-time high. And it's one of the most impactful moments of Nate's character arc this season, perhaps of the series at this point. Despite all of the success Nate is experiencing, he still can't get the approval he expects from his father. And even if Ted was capable of filling that void, Nate doesn't directly interact with Ted for several more episodes as Ted works on his own personal well-being. Between his unhealthy reliance on public opinion and his continuous aggression towards those he needs to tell himself are beneath him, Nate becomes more bitter by the day and more gray through each episode. There are plenty of smaller moments that result in Nate feeling slighted or neglected, of course. Ted laughs at Nate when he suggests he'll step up and serve as a big dog and speak to Isaac. I'll do it. <laughs> oh, you're being serious. Ted quickly apologizes, but the damage is done. Or Nate feels indirectly slighted by Ted for buying him a suit in season one. In season two... Nate's suit is always associated with Ted, as if Nate didn't earn the suit, it was just handed to him. Is this, um, is this the suit that Ted got you? What, the, yeah? this? Mm. Um, can't remember. Uh, yes, yeah. Another man buying you clothes is infantilizing, yes? Well, well, no. You don't buy all my clothes. So Nate goes to buy his own suit to take control of the situation. Once again, his sense of power, the go-for-it attitude that Keeley helped Nate get in touch with, it's too much for Nate. It disorients him, and Nate makes a misguided move on Keeley. Nate is humiliated by this misunderstanding. He should be. He, once again, spits at the version of himself that he sees in the mirror. Any remorse Nate has from the moment is buried, once he realizes that Roy doesn't feel threatened by Nate's actions. Just tell me about it. Is that okay? I, I kissed her. I kissed your girlfriend. We good. But all Jamie did was talk to him. You wanted to kill him. Don't you at least want to headbutt me or something? You made a mistake, Nate. 
Don't worry about it. Roy sees Jamie as a threat, but his lack of concern for Nate's transgression makes Nate feel less big or powerful. Look, the list goes on when it comes to Nate's poor judgment and aggression when we talk about season two. Nate's obsession with becoming the boss, it escalates towards the end of the season. You guys ever want to be in charge? Be the boss? Get all the credit? Interestingly enough, the fixation of who should be in charge seems to peak after Rupert takes a moment to speak to Nate at Rebecca's father's funeral. We don't know what was said in that moment, but we do know it made Nate more anxious about his role on the coaching staff. Nate may have felt like his love from the public was fading, just as Rupert swoops in with the promise of his attention and affirmation, which really makes the season's climactic portrayal by Nate all the more interesting. Nate needs recognition from Ted. Leaking information regarding Ted's panic attack accomplishes three things. One, he believes he is discrediting Ted and therefore giving himself a sense of legitimacy and power. Two, he's effectively pushing aside someone that is weaker He's relying on the stigma of mental health, especially in professional sports in this case, and giving himself a false sense of strength and stability in the process. They can win the public back if they don't approve of Ted Lasso. Lastly, he is forcing a rift between himself and Ted. Nate can now tell himself he no longer needs Ted. Of course, all of this ends with a conversation between Nate and Ted. This is where everything covered so far comes together in a single really one-sided monologue from Nate. Again, it's the first one-on-one -on -one conversation between Ted and Nate since Ted apologized for his outburst in season one, episode seven. And it's really more about Nate justifying his actions to himself than it is opening up any sort of real discussion with Ted. When you listen to his monologue, it's full of skewed rationalization and really just misunderstandings. And I, I worked my ass off trying to get your attention back, to prove myself to you, to make you like me again. But the more, the more I did, the less you cared. It's like I was fucking invisible. I haven't even got the, the photo I gave you for Christmas up in your office, just a picture of dumb Americans. And now you're gonna play Nate's false nice when the team fuck up, which they will. Okay? You can blame it on me, well no, fuck that. Everybody loves you. Without me, you wouldn't want a single match and they would have shipped your ass back to Kansas where you fucking belong with your, with your son. Because you, you sure as hell don't belong here. But I do. I belong here. This, di this didn't just fall into my lap, right? I, I earned this. And if I didn't tell you how important you were to me enough, I'm sorry about that. No, no, you're not. You're full of shit. Just fuck you, Ted. Ted is great at recognizing the qualities of those around him, and he gave Nate opportunities that put him in a position to succeed. However, what Ted didn't realize is that Nate didn't know how to navigate through his success. Nate believes Ted abandoned him, and while that's not entirely true, the root of the problem lies in that accusation. Ted succeeded at recognizing Nate's talents and by putting him in a position where he was best suited to utilize those talents. However, Ted failed at recognizing what Nate needed from that point on. Good leaders, they offer opportunity for growth, but perhaps more importantly, they help develop that growth while understanding the unique needs of the individuals that they are leading. Of course, Ted had his own share of problems he was dealing with during this time, which makes the outcome of season two all the more tragic. The final scene of season two shows us that Nate has gone to his next source of attention and recognition, Rupert a close-up on his eyes to close the season, a reversal of what we saw as the opening shot of season two. Whether it happens in the end or not, Nate is capable of finding redemption. Once again, much like every character in the show, Nate is flawed. He's not evil. He's doing what he believes needs to be done in order to achieve status and success to achieve his definition of meaningful self-worth. Regardless, Nate is now in a position where any sort of redemption may have to occur in spite of Rupert being his mentor, his current father figure. If Nate was able to overcome his insecurities and flawed understanding of leadership in that environment, he'd be even stronger in character because of it. 
Either way, Nate has become one of the most compelling characters for season three. Regardless of the outcome, it will be interesting to look back at these first two seasons to see once again, both the subtle and obvious moments that led us to, in the case of season three, what will become the conclusion of Nate the Great.